This is the world's first jet airliner. This is the world's first turboprop airliner. And this is the world's first supersonic airliner. All were products of Great Britain's proud aerospace industry in the 20th century. And we're gonna be looking at these machines and more in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. By request, many of the uh, viewers I have in the uh, United Kingdom were kind enough to suggest this and I'm happy to oblige, hope you enjoy it. So we're gonna be talking about British airliners. And I started putting the list together and this isn't even all of them, there's quite a few. Uh, so I had visions of starting out with the de Havilland uh, DH4. Today is September 1st, 2021. And I could just envision uh, starting to talk about the de Havilland DH4A, a two-seater that flew at 100 miles an hour. And uh, a year from now, September 1st, 2022, I'd be finishing up with the Concorde. So with that in mind, we're going to be looking at famous British airliners. Before we dive into that subject, I'd like to just mention that uh, growing up as a kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, I was always fascinated with these concepts of new airplanes. And here we have a British turboprop airliner that was still on the drawing board. And uh, I thought it was kind of cool to draw a picture of it uh, in the markings that I could see at the airport, uh, airplanes flying over my house, whatever. And it was kind of a neat exercise. Uh, the elegant V bombers, the Cold War deterrent aircraft, uh, in the 60s, uh, we had the <clears throat> Avro Vulcan, the Vickers Valiant that you see here, and the Hanley Page Victor, which I drew in charcoal, inspired by the great artwork of Frank Wooten. And of course, art imitates life. I always wondered what would it be like to stand in front of an airliner and, and actually sketch it live? I thought that would be pretty cool. And I had my chance uh, in the early 60s, knew a number of people at Idlewild Airport who were nice enough to let me out on the ramp. And so uh, uh, that, uh, that dream came true. Later in my career, I had a number of commissions uh, for British aircraft. I always had an affinity for these machines, like this Blackburn uh, Beverly. And uh, it was always a joy to, to work on them and, and to uh, uh, just admire the beautiful lines of these aircraft. So the story of post-war commercial aviation in Great Britain begins in 1941 in the sense that uh, the Gloucester E-2839, powered by uh, the Whittle engine, Sir Frank Whittle, all of 1,760 pounds of thrust, uh, really was a harbinger of the jet transports and even the turboprops to come later. Uh, I say 1,760 pounds. Think of that compared to a Rolls-Royce Trent on a 777 today that produces nearly 100,000 pounds of thrust. So aviation has come quite far. In 1942, the Brabazon Committee was formed to assess post-World War II commercial aviation programs in Great Britain. In 1943, the Brabazon Report was issued, which formulated a forward-thinking plan for four new types of airliners. The Type 1 was to be a large piston-powered transatlantic luxury airliner, while the Type 4 was a turbojet-powered aircraft. That's pretty futuristic stuff in 1943. Well, the Type 1 became the Bristol Brabazon, named after Lord Brabazon, and it first flew in 1949. Let's take a look at some of the specs. It was a mammoth airplane, largest uh, in the world at the time. Uh, the 230-foot wings, wingspan was six feet longer than today's Boeing 747-8. It had a uh, whopping 5,500-mile range, weighed nearly 300,000 pounds at takeoff, uh, and carried from 60 passengers in a luxury interior to up to 300 in coach uh, and was powered by eight Bristol Centaurus piston engines that were buried in the wings. Uh, it was the first airplane ever to fly with 100% powered flight controls. But like the Republic Rainbow in the United States, as good as the airplane was, it was at the wrong time for the market. And so it did not have any orders, even from BOAC, and the program was canceled in 1953. Uh, I will say, however, that Bristol benefited from the engineering of this airplane when they went and designed the Britannia a few years later. We'll talk about that in a moment. But another airplane first flew in 1949, and that was the de Havilland DH-106 Comet 1. And this became the world's first successful jet airliner. Take a look at the cockpit. It's a bit simpler than the piston-powered aircraft of the day. Uh, very sleek and streamlined on the outside. And uh, it was an elegant looking airplane. It carried 36 passengers 
Uh, it uh, cruised at 490 miles per hour. It had a 1500 mile range. Now think about that. Uh, the airplane gulped a lot of fuel in those days, but 1500 mile range would be the equivalent of a regional airliner today. It was powered by de Havilland Ghost turbojets uh, producing 4,400 pounds of thrust each. And in 1952, it entered service and created the world's first jet airline network with British Overseas Airways Corporation. Uh, a shout out to our friends in Canada. I call this the other first jet, the Avro Jetliner, which flew 13 days after the Comet 1 in, uh, in 1949. We'll be talking about the Jetliner in our Howard Hughes uh, video coming up shortly. I also want to correct the uh, record. Uh, I had made a comment in an earlier video about the Boeing Stratocruiser being the first double deck airliner. And the Stratocruiser first flew in 1947. This airplane flew in 1952. So it technically came afterward, but uh, I'll give it uh, credit. It is the first double deck from nose to tail uh, airliner that flew, and that's the Saunders Row SR-42 Princess flying boat. The world's first turboprop airliner was the Vickers Viscount, the 700 series, entered service with British European Airways in 1953. It carried 48 passengers, had a 310 mile an hour cruise speed, and was powered by Rolls-Royce Dart turboprop engines. And I thought I'd take a minute to talk about the Dart. It was a very successful power plant. Here are some of the other airplanes that were powered by the Rolls-Royce Dart. The Hanley Page Herald, the Fokker F-27, the Grumman Gulfstream 1, the NAMC YS-11, and other airplanes like the HS-748 and others. But the Viscount 700 series, uh, as I said, went into service in 53 in Europe. And in 1956, uh, with Capital Airlines in the United States and TransCanada uh, on uh, no the North American continent. Uh, it was a successful airplane, very efficient and uh, very popular with the passengers with the big oval windows. Uh, it was uh, quite a nice machine. Uh, an upgrade to that airplane was the 800 series Viscount, uh, which came about in 1956. This carried 75 passengers, had a 330 mile an hour cruise, had a longer range of 2,100 miles, and was powered by uprated dark turboprops producing 2,000 shaft horsepower. First flew in the U.S. with Continental, good looking airplane, and uh, very successful for those stage lengths. I'm going to introduce the next airliner with this model kit, one of my all-time favorites, the Frog uh, kit of the BOAC Whispering Giant, the Bristol Britannia. Britannia entered service in 1957, flew with BOAC, El Al, Aeronaves de Mexico, carried from 114 to 140 passengers, cruised at 400 miles an hour, and had a 4,400-mile range. Uh, it was powered by Bristol Proteus turboprops, producing 4,400 shaft horsepower. We see it here at uh, Kennedy International Airport. And you remember that concept I showed you before, that was for the Vickers Vanguard. The Vanguard entered service in 1961, carried 141 passengers. It was uh, in essence, the uh, Brit British version of the Lockheed Electra, uh, same general uh, uh, parameters, cruised at 420 miles per hour. And, uh, powered by Rolls-Royce Tyne turboprops, uh, which had 4,100 shaft horsepower. A very successful airplane flown also by TransCanada and used as a freighter later on in its uh, career. In 1958, an improved version of the Comet 1, the Comet 4, entered service with BOAC. And this is a very historic airplane. Uh, in October of 58, uh, it was the first jet airliner to carry passengers across the Atlantic landing at New York's uh, Idlewild Airport at that time uh, on October 4th, 1958. A groundbreaking airplane that beat Pan Am uh, 707 into service by two weeks. What a beautiful, this is one of my favorite photos. If you notice uh, the flaps are uh, lowered a bit. And so I'm guessing that the camera plane was a prop, but the Comet 4 carried 80 passengers up from uh, the Comet 1's 36, had a 500 mile cruise speed, and uh, was powered by Rolls-Royce Avon 524 turbojets uh, of 10,500 pounds thrust each. A uh, very successful airplane, flew with the Royal Air Force, Dan Air, well into the 1990s. 
Here's the interior of the Comet 4 with the early version of sleeper seats, as you see. And no, this isn't a British airplane. This is a 707, but it's powered by Rolls-Royce engines. This is the 400 series, and the engines were Rolls-Royce Conway. This is an interesting design. It was uh, called a bypass engine. It was the beginning of the turbofan uh, configuration where a larger turbine uh, would uh, create a shroud of cooler air and then uh, exit out the exhaust, and that would boost uh, uh, the thrust, in this case, by over 1,000 pounds over comparable Pratt & Whitney engine at that time. So the 707 Intercontinental 420 uh, was powered by Rolls-Royce Conways, as was the Douglas DC-8 Series 40. The airplane you see here in Canadian Pacific markings uh, became the first commercial jetliner to achieve supersonic speed. It was an experimental uh, uh, flight uh, in a dive at uh, 42,000 feet over Edwards Air Force Base. The speed was calibrated at just barely over Mach 1. And the F-104 chase plane you see there was flown by a, a fairly historic figure. That's Chuck Yeager in the cockpit, the first man ever to fly supersonic. The BAC-111 came along in the early 60s. I used this photo before in an American Airlines video. And the great Ron Davies always told me, if you have a good photo and you've used it before, but it's the best one you have, use it again. So I'll honor that. Uh, but the BAC-111 was a uh, really one of the first regional jets uh, went into service in the mid-60s, flew on the East Coast uh, with Allegheny and a number of other Mohawk and other uh, airlines uh, that used it uh, for short and medium-range uh, stage lengths. It was powered by Rolls-Royce Spey engines, as was this airplane. Uh, the it was originally a de Havilland design, and then later a Hawker Sidley 121 Trident. Uh, this was a, a unique airplane. It was the first trijet to fly. It had a uh, side-retracting uh, nose wheel. Uh, it was the first jet airliner to make a Cat 3 landing, and uh, it was a, a pioneering airplane. It even had a rocket boost in the tail, uh, kind of a JATO assist for high, hot uh, takeoffs. Quite a nice machine. Speaking of proposals, here we have a model of a four-engine jet with uh, the engines mounted in the rear and a beautiful T-tail. And this, of course, is the Vickers VC-10. Uh, a, a lengthened version of that airplane was the Super VC-10, which went into service with BOAC in 1964. What a beautiful airplane. Carried 150 passengers, had a 550 mile hour, an hour cruise speed, and was powered by Rolls-Royce Conway uh, turbofans with uh, upgraded 22,000 pounds of thrust. And this was a real workhorse across the, uh, uh, the North Atlantic and to points east from Europe. So here's uh, from the observation deck at Idle, or Idlewild, now JFK Airport uh, in New York. Uh, you'd always see the, um, uh, the Super VC-10 parked at these gates uh, at the International Arrivals Building. And uh, I wanna take a moment to just give you a little scenario at JFK. Uh, well, let's get in the car and go out to 150th Street. And oh, look, you have another four engine rear mount T-tail airplane landing. This is the uh, Russian uh, Ilyushin IL-62. And then, oh, the wind just changed. They're going to use runway 22 left. Let's get back in the car, go out to Rockaway Boulevard. There's a Super VC-10 landing on uh, 22 left. We go back to the IAB, uh, great observation deck. And if you look at the tower, on the 12th floor of the control tower was an observation deck uh, that was inside. It was run by the Port Authority. You put 10 cents in a turnstile, and you'd sp I'd spend all day up there had earphones, you could hear uh, ATC, radio communication. You'd look out on the horizon, see some smoke, and two minutes later, a jet would be landing right in front of you. It was just magic. But I mention this because from that observation deck, I took this photo. And this must be the uh, four-engine rear mount T-tail parking area at JFK. But uh, here was that airplane, literally the one we just saw landing, parked with two Super VC-10s. Kind of a unique, uh, unique arrangement on the ground. Pretty cool. Well, now we're in the supersonic era. This is the uh, Ferry Delta II, the first airplane to fly more than 1,000 miles per hour. In March of 1956, the Delta II set a record beating the previous U.S. record by more than 300 miles per hour. And I mention this because this was the beginning of the supersonic age. And in uh, France, there was an airplane called the Super Caravelle that was a proposal and in Great Britain, they were studying supersonic transports. Those two efforts were merged in the early 60s, and the airplane that resulted from that was called Concorde. 
They don't use the word the. Uh, here we see it in British Airways markings. This is during a visit to LAX in 1974. Up close and personal, you can see some of the design features of the airplane. This is how the nose operates. The nose cone lowers in five different positions for takeoff and landing to improve visibil visibility. And that uh, visor that you see at upper right is actually a, a cover for the flat windshield uh, that's used uh, at supersonic speed. And it retracts into the nose cone, which then lowers for takeoff and landing. Well, let's take a look at some of the unique features of the Concorde. You've got the tail wheel to prevent tail strikes at high angles of attack. Here are the elevons and the thrust reversers. The engines are uh, Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 turbojets uh, that produce uh, 38,000 pounds of thrust in afterburner or reheat, as they say in Great Britain. And the uh, landing gear is unique. If you look at the hub on the wheel, it's got a self-contained cooling fan to cool the brakes on uh, the high speeds of takeoff and landing. Quite an elegant machine. It sits very high up off the ground uh, because, it, again, it needs a high angle of attack on takeoff and landing, and this gives it clearance to do that. The cockpit of the Concorde is a surprise. The airplane first flew in March of 1969, and so the cockpit is all steam gauges. There's no, uh, no glass cockpit here. At altitude, you can just barely begin to see the curvature of the Earth. Uh, the temperature on the outside is quite high. The tip of the nose cone can reach uh, a temperature of 260 degrees Fahrenheit, but the view is spectacular. And even at 60,000 feet, you feel the speed. It's like being in the nose of a guided missile. As I said, the cockpit is fairly uh, compact and uh, it's uh, quite an array of technology from an earlier age. It's even got that quilted panel up on the ceiling. But uh, let's zoom in on the flight engineers panel. And uh, this is our performance. Uh, we're at Mach 2. Uh, if you look at the upper row of gauges there, we're at Mach 2 at uh, 56,900 feet, crews climbing up to 60,000 feet, outside air temperature, 100, or skin temperature, I should say, 107 uh, degrees centigrade. Concorde uh, flew from 1976 uh, to 2003. And uh, it was just a great machine uh, in its time. Uh, top speed was Mach 2.04, faster than Scott Crossfield flew in the Skyrocket the first time any airplane had flown Mach 2. And I want to close with this airplane, the BAE uh, 146, uh, the Model 200, and the Stretch uh, 300 that you see here. A great airplane, and uh, it was flown by PSA and Air California here in, Calif in uh, the West Coast, where I live and it is used effectively as a fire bomber today. So there you have it, a look at famous British airliners. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. As always, we say thanks to the good folks who uh, help make these uh, videos possible uh, with imagery and information. And again, I thank you for watching. Uh, it's always a pleasure bringing these uh, presentations to you, and I do hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, take care.